Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan. Here's Adam. Here's Brandon. Hey! Today we're gonna tell you how we felt. This is really a problem. Today we're gonna tell you how we felt about uh, the Star Trek Deep Space Nine documentary, What We Left Behind. Looking back at Star Trek Deep Space Nine, we just went to the Fathom event for this, and uh, we're gonna tell you uh, briefly about it and our thoughts. Uh, this is not a thing that you can go to the theater for anymore, because uh, that happened already. It's done. <laughs> it was just one time, one, time, one but and done. You'll be able to buy it soon, or you can already. I'm not even know. sure if it's already out. I think it, yeah. You said there was a an ad there before it. Still photo of the DVD slash Blu-ray. So that's coming box. real soon. Like by the time this is posted, you're coming like, to you to soon or possibly to already bed. to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this was a passion project from Iris Stephen Bear, who essentially uh, plays the William Shatner role in making this documentary. Uh, the the guy who made this, uh, the, the the guy who you know, pitched this and produced it and wanted Bear to host it. I worked with Shatner on some of his other Star Trek documentaries, but he had already made so many of them, mm. he knew Shatner wouldn't want to do it. So he got Shatner's blessing to make one on Deep Space Nine, but he wasn't actually involved in it. And Bear took that role, and of course, he's the guy to do that, mm -hmm. either him or Moore. Mm -hmm. And Moore's probably more busy than him mm -hmm. uh, right now on shows. Although, I don't know what Bear's doing. I don't know either. I'm not certain. Was he, was he Outlander, and is that still on? No, that's, well, yeah, he may have been. Outlander. I thought that was him. No, Ron Moore's Outlander. Oh, Ron Moore's Outlander. I don't, okay. I don't know what he's doing. Uh, I can't keep track of all that anymore, and I'm not watching some of the shows. So, right. anyway, uh, but this is a thing that's been uh, in production for seven years, mm -hmm. uh, off and on, and was a big crowdfunded thing. And it's finally here. It's finally out. And um, the big selling point for this, the thing I kept hearing touted up over the last few months is that uh, there's a writer's room where uh, the original uh, major writers all get in a room uh, like you would usually break a story and they break a pilot for what a season 8 would look like right. if you made it right now and if the story took right. place 20 years after the original show. The other big selling point for this is all of the footage that's used from uh, the actual show is upscaled to uh, high definition and is widescreen and looks amazing and it's really cool that we got to see that. So uh, we're going to tell you uh, how we felt about it and uh, let's start with Adam. Adam, what did you think of this documentary? I was feeling it. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it, it, I mean, there are little bits of it that I didn't like all that much, but overall I really, I, I thought it was, you know, a good retrospective of the of the series and how it felt, fit in with the overall franchise and uh you and I have watched so many special features yeah. about these shows. Yeah. Did you hear a lot you've heard before? Or was there a lot of new stuff? Some of it, but I think some of it was new. I hadn't seen as much DS9 special features, so there was a lot of new stuff and it, and it was just fun seeing everybody again. Come, come back. And, uh, yeah, one of the big deals for me was seeing a lot of folks that I hadn't seen in so long and just seeing what they look like now. Yeah. Um, Nana Visitor has a cool look yeah, these she days. Does. Like, she's aged really well. Yeah, she looks yeah. awesome. Uh, I love and, Yeah, and. <laughs> it was really interesting uh, seeing some of those folks. And then people who really haven't changed all that much at all, like yeah. uh, Grand Nigga Zed Guy. The uh, Wallace Shawn. Uh, exactly. Wallace Shawn? He looks exactly the same. Yeah. You know, yeah. I and he's probably 90 years old yeah. at this point. I didn't actually realize that was Wallace Shawn. And, and, but as soon as they said that, I was like, oh my God, yes. Yeah. That's yep. definitely Wallace Shawn. Yeah. Um, Brandon, what did you think of this? Uh, well, I am definitely feeling it. Uh, as someone who, w when I was much, much younger, I did watch DS9, but I've largely forgotten large swaths of of this show, but I still love it when I do get to see episodes of it. I just need to see it from the beginning sometime and watch it all the way through. But seeing this was actually really interesting, partly because of what you said in that you get to see some of these people, how they look today. But here's an interesting thing. I've never actually looked up what most of these people looked like outside oh, of their makeup. And seeing like Garrick mm -hmm. out of his makeup, Holy cow, that was really cool. I will say, yeah, I actually wasn't familiar with his look. Yeah, I don't think yeah, I've I, ever seen him at a makeup. I had, and of course, I've, I've seen Rene Abajamois. I don't think he is. I don't he think is. he is. I'm almost positive he's not. I don't think Damar he is. is yeah. But I'm, I'm pretty sure he's yeah, not. Yeah, like the Cardassians outside of their makeup was really fascinating. Yeah. And it was just really cool. And of course, you, you know, you've got people like 
Nana Visitor or Cole mm -hmm. Meany, you know what they look like because they basically looked mm -hmm. like that on screen. Max Grodenchik has always uh, done this kind of self-deprecating joke where where uh, he says he just looks like Rom, mm -hmm. like like be, like people would 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 ask would would like ask you know when he's that was when he's in makeup like what do you look like without yeah. makeup? And kind of the same. Yeah, I'm looking <laughs> at him like. Wow. He's one of those guys that has gotten more distinguished with age. Yes. Like, he looks better as an older guy. Yeah. I knew what he looked like because he plays the... Uh, We're just talking about, about the, like, aesthetics of people's faces. At the risk of mentioning right the Rocketeer again, he <laughs> plays the, uh, the yes. guy that steals yeah, yeah. The, the rocket pack oh at the beginning goodness. of the movie. Yeah, wow. he crashes the car. He has a lot of bit roles in yeah. 90s movies like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're just we're just we're just talking about surface <laughs> stuff right now. Yeah. Uh, I will say that yeah, I I loved the uh, I loved how obviously passionate these actors were about their characters on this show. It it really did sh in, in the episodes that I have seen. You know, you can tell that there's a particular camaraderie amongst them and how they just mm -hmm. play off of each other. But to see them interacting as themselves and how much friends they actually are yeah. and still get along at the reunion of after the close of this show was really quite nice and, you know, quite refreshing. I know that, like, especially among uh, cast members in Star Trek shows specifically... There's a little bit of a of a tight knit group there, but this really felt like the the kind of the I don't know the the they 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 work so well together. They're still such friends, and that it, it just showed through in what they did. I think it's important to mention that at one time, uh, when we were still closer to when these things were <clears throat> made, and people still had contracts with with uh, with the studio and things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was more of an attempt to pretend like nothing bad ever happened, mm -hmm. particularly on TNG, and it was uh, super refreshing to use your word when the TNG documentary came out. That it was more tell-all, mm -hmm. and you got to, and, and you, you got to hear about some of the not so pleasant things that happened, yeah. and uh, you got that with this. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. uh, uh, maybe there's more of it we could have had, but like. I uh, Bear did not shy away from using candid stuff, right. and I imagine when we get some special features, we'll see even more right. of it. But mm -hmm. I love Mark Alamo, I mean, and that, and that mm -hmm. he allowed that to be there. There's a place where Mark Alamo just breaks down and is like, I, I, I didn't feel like I was ever respected on this oh, show. Yeah. Right. That and he crazy. says it in front of a room of 14 other right. people who worked on that show. And... Uh, it was, was really cool to see some of that. Yeah, I, I was. Still, the visitor complaining about stuff that was done yeah. with Kira toward the end mm -hmm. uh, with Dukat. Yeah, it's great. I was just when I was disturbed. It was still, how upset, upsetting I guess, the whole thing was for Terry Farrell. I know. Was leaving and stuff. Oh, that and was. She like, yeah. still yeah. having a hard time not breaking into tears talking about right. it. Right. Yeah, yeah, that was still that was very her. telling. I had no idea yeah. that her departure was such a such a, a thing for her. And the way they kill her off is awful. Right. And everybody knew it. Right. And yeah. You uh, like the so, idea that they said in the in the uh in the documentary how they should have done it a different way and It's interesting that one of the writers remembered it the way <clears throat> that a lot of people have complained it should have been. Right. And that's probably what he's remembering is people saying yeah. like why right. didn't you just do it this way? Right. Uh so let's talk a little bit um I'm I'm feeling as well. In fact I wanna say uh this very quickly is is vying for like a top five or top ten spot for a uh, favorite documentary. I, I I thought this was fantastic, um, super well put together, and I got to see a lot of people that I haven't seen interviewed before. That was that was a, that was a thing I really appreciated, um, and I liked the. I like the style of this. I like the panache about it. It yeah. is classy. Yeah. It is a super classy documentary. Doesn't take itself too seriously, right. but then. Uh, and, and like I think, without giving too much away, uh, in case folks want to watch this, um, it's it's bookended with songs, which are really fun, and uh, it's 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 got um, it's got a like a jovial nature about it, of course, and I think that helps to kind of offset the heavy stuff mm -hmm. because you've seen a lot of documentaries about. Uh, TV shows and movies where they act like they're more culturally important than they are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or they act like they were deeper and more thoughtful and about more stuff than they were. And this is real self-aware and thoughtful where it is about 
all of the social commentary. There, there are whole sections about, right. and, and we talked about religion, and here's what that was was, was like right. and what we had to say about it and how it impacted people right. and, uh, you know, how we dealt with uh, with race and gender right. and, and, all, and all of that. And that would have felt, I think, laid on more thick right. if we didn't also have fun with it. Right. And I was really glad that we did right. that. It was important to talk about that stuff. You didn't feel laid on too thick no, to me. There was something that, you know, now, this, the way they, they did it, the scene, like you said, was very scripted, but yeah. I was very, but I did appreciate them acknowledging their own shortcomings with like the LGBT representation that they feel like they could have done more, even in the '90s potentially. I also feel like Bear with that, uh, and I guess I'm just criticizing Bear now. This isn't anything about like like how the documentary is made, but just things he said. I feel like he's selling himself a little bit short retroactively because mm -hmm. he's living in a world where. Those those ideas and and uh, and and people of that persuasion are obviously more um, or more accepted, True. and they weren't at the time. And you wouldn't even necessarily think to go there in as in as big of a way. It's true, uh, but though I do feel like I do see what he's saying. But they could have maybe done a little more because the original series, you know, did stuff that as far as. That's yeah, true, right, you know. but it did it in token episodes, just it like the S nine did with with, with uh with um with the uh, rejoined. rejoined. Yeah. yeah, I will say one negative I had about this yeah. uh, this documentary was I wanted more Avery Brooks. Well, like, well that's, that's not that's their that fault. Not they couldn't get him. No, I, I uh, understand. I understand that, but not... I just wish that we could have had more. He's a fascinating <laughs> character. Yeah, he's not lucid. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It might be for the best that we didn't have a whole lot of Avery Brooks in this commentary. Um, He's I fascinating. Though. I don't. I don't know if you noticed it, Brandon, but what little of him was in this was extra footage they didn't use in the captains. Yeah. I, uh, I did. He, he, they, they, he's not. He wasn't actually interviewed for this, and it's right. kind of sad. And I want. I don't know what the situation is. I want to say it's kind of crappy that he didn't come in for this. Right. But I don't. I don't want to judge the man. I don't know what his reasons are. Sure. So. Yeah. Uh, so who knows? But my my sense is Shatner convinced them to do the captains. Mm -hmm. and that doesn't he doesn't like to interview. Right. Sure. And it's clear when he's interviewed that he does the way he dodges questions is very interesting right. and hysterical. Right. Uh, but but I did I did enjoy people talking about what it was like working with him and how difficult he is to talk to and the the way you have yeah. to kind of find his level. I've never heard people talk about Avery Brooks in anything but a like super professional loving way mm -hmm. and in this there are like overt criticisms but you could tell people were a little frustrated dealing with his rhythm of conversation yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't get real super into it but there are a couple people that talk about it a little bit where we, and, and everybody says he's like a jazz musician the right. way he talks and you can tell that they're saying that lovingly and yeah. it's it, it's a little endearing there's a hint of frustration oh, yeah. from well, yeah, everybody that, uh, that says uh, that. What was her? Is her name Lolita Fajo? Was that her name? Um, I'm not sure, sure who you're talking. Well, about. she was the lady that talked about. I need you to tell me what you need. Yeah, yeah. And, I, uh, and I missed the the credit for uh, for uh, for who who exactly she yeah. was and what she did. I hadn't seen her before. Yeah, what, I've seen who, her who, name a lot. On who, like, who is she? What, what is she? What did she do though? I do not remember. Okay. Oh, her <laughs> last her last name spelled F A, F -A T J O. Yeah. But I'm not sure what she did on the show. I missed that. I don't, I don't remember either. How do you guys feel about the structure of this? It flowed fairly well for me. I mean, everything seemed to... They didn't jump from, like, here to here to here to here. It, it kind of just went in an order. I mean, they did, right? Well, like, I mean, they, they went... They had several parallel, I feel like, parallel storylines. So they were in this storyline about the, 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 the actors, and they were in this storyline about the writers' rooms. But I felt like they were all fairly linear. But in they what did they jump were... around within the context of the series. Yeah. 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 I, I, I felt sometimes like there wasn't a lot of rhyme or reason to why we were going from this topic to this topic. Yeah. Um, it, it felt like there were a lot of... I'd love to see if there was like an outline for the way this ultimately was structured mm -hmm. and, and put together after they had all the footage because it felt like every so often you'd get a discussion about a specific actor and their character and it would probably be kind of mundane to put in and tedious to put all of those together but I was wondering what like the logic was of when like like 
I'm thinking I'm missing a subcategory where it's like, okay, we do pieces of the writer's room where they keep making you wait to find out the next plot point for the uh, for the for the pilot they're, or for the for the season eight pilot they're pitching. Mm -hmm. Every so often you get a character piece of, right. of an actor and their character. There's another subcategory I'm missing of like right. of like we, we jump from that to then to then this thing and I'm not sure what that other category is. Right. And it's weird to me that they had they left in a sequence about Esri, but they really didn't talk about Miles O'Brien's role on the show. No. All that uh, at there all. were a couple of people that were skimped over a little bit, especially yeah. because I mean, you'd think everybody that was <clears throat> that had a main cast credit yeah. would have gotten a section. And they didn't all really. And like, keep in mind that O'Brien was like the family man on the show, right. and so there were other recurring supporting characters that existed because he was there, and right. he doesn't mm -hmm. get. We don't even and talk he about. Also, our audience kind of surrogate too for a lot of the time, because he was, you know, they always pitched him as like the every guy, you know, the every man of the. I liked I that I. <laughs> Because I had never heard this before. There's a lot of talk about it, like, how he complained a lot, and he admits that like I complained all the time, yeah. and that wasn't a thing I had ever heard before. And the picture I saw painted of him was that he's a little bit like, uh, he's a little bit like Dewan was. Right. Was the sense I got. Right. Right. Uh, but yeah, I felt like he was a little bit shafted. There were a couple of other characters that I thought were somewhat shafted. Mm -hmm. Uh. But uh, but I mean I appreciated how much we got from uh, from Go from Grodenchik and how mm -hmm. much we got from uh, from uh, what's his face who plays Nog and yeah. um, I was surprised and, I was surprised to get so little from Hertzler. Yeah, there was he was barely, barely in there, and then Robert Riley didn't say anything. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they made a joke about that in the credit, and I don't so, know if that was because he didn't want to talk or if it was that. They, once they got the documentary together, that's the only thing they used. They felt uh, bad that they, they didn't bad. use yeah, any more from Robert O'Reilly. Uh, because that was the only shot they had of Hurlitzer. Of uh, Hurlitzer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they had a... <laughs> uh, and we got a lot from uh, a lot of supporting actors who weren't mm -hmm. even regulars who seemed to, to, to talk a lot more than... Uh, other people that were there all the time, like right. Demar's there a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and like, Garrick deserves it because he was nearly well, being yeah, cast by the cast. end. Right. Uh, I did not realize. Of course, I I I know that D Space Nine had a lot of regular recurring characters. I didn't realize how many there oh, were yeah. that n were so regular that they nearly were like main yeah, cast. That like that's whole, fascinating. That's one of the things that's in, really special about that in show. In seven seasons, that's huge. Right. Like, th what did they say, 18? And then they start naming them off, and it's just like, wow. Now, yeah, absolutely. Those, that was really cool. Yeah, that was cool. But some of those people they named were really only in a couple episodes. A couple episodes, yeah. 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 Did, they, did they bring up, uh, was the actress who played Zial in that list? I don't think so. I don't well, think that's she because was. there's three actresses that play Zial. There are three different Okay, actresses. but there was the, one who was the there one more that was often. The main one. Yeah. yeah. But, like, she should have been name dropped because she yeah. was in more than three episodes. Right, right. And it's. I forgot there were three. I thought there were just two. Right. I would have liked to have seen Salome Jens come back, but I don't know. She's probably pretty old at this point. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, and where was, uh, where was Wynn? That's true. Louise Fletcher. Louise Fr right Fletcher now. is not interviewed right. either. Yeah. But I don't know what kind of shape she's in either. I, don't I mean, know. Yeah. maybe she's not in good health, and I don't know it. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I. Right. They both I hate to say that. I don't know. Back to the sixties. Yeah. Sure. We, without revealing too much of the of the pilot episode for season yeah, eight. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk about uh, that. I really dug their narrative for that. I thought that it started in an interesting place, and I loved getting to see their thought process of how they put an episode together. Did, did you think all that was pretty on point? I like, that so. the, the, you would buy all those characters where they were? I think so. I thought the Bashir idea was really good. Yeah. Uh, we, we won't give away what exactly is there. Um, I really expected the... Uh, I expected some of the stuff that they pitched for the pilot to be things that you would wait on mm -hmm. in, in, in a season. I, they, I, they pack a lot in right, that, right. but uh, it was also really fun just to see, like, like Brandon said, just to see uh, how a writer's room is broken down like mm -hmm. that, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the way uh, people bounce off each other, and the respect that people have where, um, where at least everybody in that room, uh, and I mean, it helps that 
this is not a thing that's going to actually get made. But you get the sense that this is how these guys work, where everybody's respectful enough that if somebody wants to negate an idea you have, it's not the rules of improv, where everything somebody says must count right, now, right. even if you think it sucks. Right. So you yeah. can say, I don't know about that, let's do this, and then if everybody right. likes it, you know, you, 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 you kind of deliberate. Or then, they like, then, they you, like you one on. thing of an idea, and they're like, what if, what if we it's this started other thing? here, but we went here instead of I like here? It, I like how they introduced a brand new important character and somebody just threw out a name and they're like yeah let's call him that and then yeah. the rest of the time that's <laughs> and it, 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 it worked within the context of like Bajoran names yeah. and it was great uh, what they do with uh, with Bajor in that is exactly what I would want to see done with Bajor the yeah. the almost the almost like Bajor Cardassian flip thing right. like I've always that's that's what I would do with it and it, the, the status quo that they were coming up with sounded more interesting to me than some stuff that's been, that I know about that's been done in novels. Right. Um, boy, I would, I would, I would love to see that. How, yeah. how did you guys like the duality of Kira's character? Just the the playing, the, like these are her people that she worked with for so right. long, and then all of a sudden that's a good idea. That's a good thing to do with her. Um, where, where are they the position they put her in, I would never have thought of. Yeah, I wouldn't have expected her to go to that role either, but... In 20 years, I could see it maybe happening. Just right. an evolution but, yeah, over time. And, and she had kind of... Because she, uh, she wasn't very religious when the show started, and then she did become more... More so as it went along, I, too. So I, I would argue she wasn't as involved it. in it, but she always was very devout. Very devout. Oh, yes. Yeah. She was almost like a Roman Catholic who doesn't go to church anymore, right. but still would want to be buried in a Catholic cemetery. Well, that was the well, sense I would... Well, and as far as the emissary is concerned. And, like, goes to confessional yeah. every now and again, uh -huh. that kind of thing? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. A holiday yeah. Catholic. Um, but centering that whole season around the whole Bajor was supposed to join the Federation, mm -hmm. and they never did, thank God. It, just, it sounded sounds really good. Yeah. Um, and of, of course, obviously, we'll never see that. And I saw an interview today with uh, Bear where he where somebody asked him, uh, would you want to see that done in comic form, book form, or anything? And he said, no. He said, he said I, I've never, and people have come to me and asked me, would you write comics? And tried to get him to write comics. Mm -hmm. He's like, I don't, I don't want it done in comics. He's like, if we ever did anything again, I would want it to only be in live action. Mm -hmm. I'd do it if it was a movie. I'd do it if it was a TV show. Mm -hmm. That's the only way I would How do cool it. How cool of a movie would that yeah. be, though? Like, I, that'd be a great DS9 movie. Yeah, the problem with just coming back, uh, <clears throat> and I know we're not even reviewing this right now, but the, the, the problem <laughs> with like coming back, I think, and, and just doing a DS9 movie is there's so much setup you'd have to do for status quo, it would be really hard for it not to just feel like a pilot. Mm. Which is yeah. why I think it was smart that they tried to break a pilot and not a whole season or to try to pitch it like a movie. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I was going to say a minute ago about where they where they put Kira in that mm -hmm. is the thing that sold me on it was just the drawing of what she looks like. Oh, yeah. In, like in that garb. Oh, yeah, it's the, cool. The, the, yeah. the costume design, it was really neat. I can definitely way. see a visitor like that as she is now, too. Uh, the, I, I should mention the uh, the drawings and the animation with all that uh, is cool. Obviously, they don't have all, enough of a budget to like fully animate it. Mm -hmm. I was actually kind of glad that they didn't fully animate it. Yeah. It was kind of storyboardish. Yeah, and it like should that. be because mm -hmm. you're just watching a pitch meeting. Right. right. Or, or you're just watching a storyboard meeting. Right, right. So that was really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> So, did you guys have the same thing I did where you walked out of this and you were like, well, now that I've seen it in high def, yeah. it's going to be really unfortunate if that never yeah, happens. A little, right. a little bit, yeah. yes, because, like, they talked about, had, and the the fascination I had behind how they had to pull these films mm -hmm. and how CBS helped them and what they could get away with and what they couldn't, mm -hmm. like, that was just fascinating to me. I never realized that, you know, they're not pulling just the film that they used in the episode. Yeah. for the end right. episode they're pulling everything from all the dailies and all that stuff and that was that was really fascinating but seeing it in high def yeah i definitely want to see it well, in high now def that some people like went through the trouble to go find as much of that as they did mm -hmm. they know where it is now yeah i mean it would all like, like i don't know if it would be any cheaper now that they know where it is yeah, probably but, yeah and that's like, who would, it cost, it's, it's i think i heard somewhere that the each season of tng Remaster costs like a couple million dollars to do, or something like. Wow! That. So it, like, it'll I, I'm pretty never sure the money's out it. there, though. Yeah. The money's out there. Somebody maybe that was get total, but it's still a lot, you know. Um. So, do, do you have I uh, Adam? And I'm asking Adam because mm -hmm. you don't know really quite as well. But have, have you had the same perception that a lot of the actors did, uh, particularly talking at the beginning of 
the movie that that DS9 remains in a lot of circles is kind of the redheaded stepchild because I feel like I feel like it's flipped over the years over it's the flipped years. more I yeah think it's actually the most one of the most respected ones now at least from I was I, hear on the I was a little surprised yeah. by that we had Armin Shimmerman saying like he still feels like it doesn't quite get the respect now it's not that as it widely known I feel That's like why. it's never in the wider culture it's not it's never going to be as widely recognized as that's, T and, uh, TOS and TNG. And, and I feel like that's just because of iconography. Like, yeah. it, when, you, when you have the bite-sized morsels that right. you do on an episodic show, where you can watch one episode and you get all of the archetypes, right. and you get all of, of like, the, the, main, the main themes and the main, you know, notions behind right. the show, uh, DS9 has to spend time with... It's a novel versus right. a movie. And, I, and it also is just because that's the way it... You know the way it played out initially too, right. and that for some reason, I mean, lightning struck twice with TNG, and it became this huge phenomena and stuff. That you know, I mean, TOS obviously that's going to be iconic because it was the original, but and TNG it just happened to happen, you know, ha happened again with that. But uh, yeah, but DS Nine definitely I could see, you know. I, I and I understand. Yeah, I understand why it's not as widely recognized, like you're saying too, because it's not. It's not as easy to get into as the other ones. And as well. you've got to watch most of it. You've got to watch at least the later stuff. Yeah. To really appreciate what that show was doing. Right. And and and, and just like the gamut of. Right. Of uh, of ideas and social issues and things that it was, and how versatile right. that show was. Because it some of the best standalone episodes in Star Trek are DS9 episodes. Right, exactly. It's the funny. best overarching stories are also in DS9. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and the thing is, like, I feel kind of bad about it because I think, cr like, 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 critically, story wise, DS9 is. I don't want to use the word objectively, but I feel like yeah, it's the it's the best show. It is the best show. It is still not my favorite show. Like yeah. I can't, I can't put it above TNG. Like TNG is still it's, my favorite it's, show. It's right. tied w for me. Is it probably sure? TNG and DS and DS Space. Now. Every time I sit, I, I watch through it. I have right. uh, it's it starts to buy for the spot, but a lot right. of that's kind of nostalgia thing. And right. uh, I mean, Picard is my favorite fictional character. Right. Of anything right. in history. Right. Uh, and so it's hard to put that. You know, right. you know like like collectively. Um, like like the entire cast of DS9 mm -hmm. is as is 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 as great as Picard to me, mm -hmm. but like nobody individually is my is my favorite. Right, right. But some of them are still more drawn than Picard is as a character. Right, I agree. They Most have, well, they have more of an arc than, than it's Picard. almost like my DC Marvel thing where it's like I'm like like I don't have a favorite character in Marvel really, mm -hmm. and in DS9 like I almost don't have a favorite character. It's just like I like that whole cast. So it's like mm -hmm. if you ask me uh, Marvel or DC, I would say Batman. If you ask me like TNG or DS9, I say Picard. Right, um, right, definitely understand that. When you want, oh, you're gonna say something. Go ahead, Brad. Uh, I was just gonna say I, I did like I, I did like another facet of this documentary where, uh, along with the fact that they were talking about how they were kind of off to a rock, rocky start with the fact that you know they were doing something completely different in Trek, at the same time that Next Generation was still going on, and then they were kind of still there when Voyager was coming on the scene, but they they also fastened this to the reality of the situation by reading the non-fan letters that they had that, that, I, yeah, that I thought was kind of really interesting. The people who That just, was interesting. You know what I didn't like about it? Yeah. No context whatsoever. I don't know when the, those were written. were written. I don't know right. where they came right. from. I don't know if they were from 20 years ago. I don't yeah, know if they were written last now. Thursday. I had that no idea. Been, that right. I would have they, liked to have known like that. that. That's the one That's the one criticism I had of that, too. But it was interesting to hear. Usually you'd put that text on screen, right. and then mm -hmm. you'd credit a person. Right. right. Or you'd give me at least a year. Right. I don't know. But it was kind of an interesting idea to go that route. Just give me a time frame. Right. And it's interesting to hear because, I mean, I watched the show as a kid and in a vacuum, so I didn't, I wasn't aware of any of this criticism. Obviously, because the internet was not really a thing at the right. time as much as it is now, at least for a kid. To get but as of. a kid, I was in the same camp, even though I wasn't hearing the criticism. I was like, "Well, I'm not going anywhere." It, 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 I don't know why. Did but you I never had that? It. I loved it. That's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't, I wasn't super exposed to it. I think part of the thing was, 
my, my parents didn't watch it for the reasons yeah. that a lot of people didn't watch it. And so I, prob I probably had a colored opinion of that. that. Was like, well, let's I, watch Voyager. They're going yeah, somewhere. I, and, the, the, and that was probably it, too. But I, I per none of my family watched Star Trek. So I chose uh, so I I, know I, I chose you. to watch it. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's. I mean, that's, my dad watched the original and stuff back in the day, but uh, so you weren't discouraged or anything. No, they just no, weren't no, into no. it. They just weren't into it. Yeah. Uh, I, there's to what you were saying, Brandon. There's a there's a wonderful sense of historical context here, uh, where I had kind of not exactly thought of it in those terms before. Where yeah, when you're working on that show, it's easy to get kind of sidestepped because. Uh, you're that in between show, mm -hmm. and yeah. I always the think, child, as they called it. yeah, and like, and like, I never thought about it as much that way. I was, I was thought of the the three middle Star Trek shows mm -hmm. as just things that had growing pains and finally got popular right. in season four. It happens every time in season four. Right. There's a gimmick that's that's added, and then people you mentioned start that watching. several times right. yeah. over the years. And like, Best of Both Worlds wasn't a gimmick, but after that, people started finally watching that show. Deep Space right. Nine, they had Worf, and then people started watching that show. Right. Voyager, they have Saturn Nine. Right. People start watching that show. Right. It's always season four, and then it gets popular. But DS Nine. I would argue DS9 never even rose to the popularity Voyager did. I think once 7 of 9 is there, that thing is a cultural phenomenon, maybe not quite to the level TNG was. DS9 never quite I, achieved that. I think that. part of the problem was the economics of television at the time, because yeah. now some of it, it... So when TNG was on the air, it was the first real experiment to do a live-action, new, syndicated, primetime television show. Really, really, really hadn't really been done, I mean, they had done things like Lassie and things like that back in the 60s, but that was like kids shows and stuff, you know, Yeah. and um, it was the first one, but then, and at the time, you had CBS, ABC, and uh, NBC, and then Fox came about, well, Fox may have come out a year before, I don't remember what year Fox came about, it may have been 86, I don't know, but, but don't it, was, it was like one night a week programming when Fox came about. Now, the thing is, then when the problem was, so then you still had, in a lot of markets, including Kansas City, which was Channel 41, which aired TNG and Deep Space Nine, mm -hmm. it was an independent station. It later right. became a Fox affiliate, but like I said, they only had a little bit of programming, so they didn't, they, they needed this syndicated program, but then Fox started expanding their programming lineup. And these shows started getting bumped to weirder and weirder time slots. And then later... And they probably weren't consistently in the same spot for the whole seven-year right. run. and they weren't. I bet it jumped everywhere. It did. That and always then, bothers me when a show does that, and I can never find and it. And this movie talks about that, where there were, there were, there were areas where right. whole episodes wouldn't even get aired. Right. It might be in the middle of a major yeah, arc. And then they, it got worse in the, in the mid-90s, because then all of a sudden these, these independent stations became either WB affiliates or UPN affiliates. So then... Ah, uh, UPN. Then the shows that were already airing on there, syndicated, wound up getting bumped to, you know, weirder times. And then you can kind of... I mean, I mean, two interesting things about that. First of all, you can kind of appreciate where the network fell and where Berman fell mm -hmm. at the time in saying people aren't going to watch the serialized show because they might not be able to commit to it. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to be able to pay for this show, we've got to... I mean, just the logistics of that, right. it makes a lot of sense, even though from a storyteller's perspective, you don't want to be handcuffed. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people immediately... And I mean, I've got issues with Berman, don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. I mean, like, like, like a lot of people like to immediately crap on Berman and Everything. say, like, if you, if you just... Uh, let them tell the stories they wanted to tell. The show would have been really successful. Not necessarily. No, and he had to, yeah, he had to watch out as a money, you know, as a money guy, as a bottom line that he had to he had to watch out for. Now, yeah, so I mean, like that's a really difficult tightrope right, to watch. To and watch, right. I had never really thought about uh, how impressive it is right. that they were able to be as serialized as they were and right. let those characters change and grow the way they did. I. Right. Uh, I mean, like, you didn't see a lot of... Obviously, super ahead of its time. I mean, Babylon 5 is like this, too. Mm -hmm. But uh, you got you got characters uh, becoming... I, I don't want to say completely different people, but having, like, really major life-changing arcs where they're so different from the end than they are mm -hmm. at the beginning, but you mm -hmm. buy the, uh, that they have they're that character right. dimension right. and that they put, and that they progressed to that place. You don't see as much of that until, like, 
shows like Buffy and Angel and stuff like that starting in 97, 98. Right, you know, this right. begins in 93. Right. And is wrapping those arcs up as Buffy is in like season three or four. Right. Right. Uh, it's really impressive. I mean, just so many of those characters just started off as just like a random one. Like, freaking Golden Cot. Yeah. He was the random Cardassian bad guy from the <laughs> first episode who uh, show you know... Who's basically up. the exact same character that he played in TNG right. and for whatever reason didn't make him the same guy. Right. Well, they totally could have. Yeah. And they, or, or, or Damar. You know, yeah. Yeah. Who was just the guy who said things in the back? Yeah. Was, you know, when uh, when Kira was Ducat's on that, right, yeah, on that, that, but, uh, when Ducat was exiled on that little freighter. Yeah. You yeah. never thought you'd see you'd see Zial become like a major right. recurring character, right. and uh, or Rom. You know, again, Rom is a completely different character. I know, who and is it? Yeah. and that's and that is not as as much of a matter of like look how much he changes and grows. Like, I mean, it is that does happen, but at some point we flip the lights, which he's a completely different. Yeah, character. he would. It he was is not first couple same, episodes. He's very conniving. I first know. couple of seasons, yeah. dude. and and he's and like the way he talks, the way he voices it is the way that Max Grodichik played Ferengi in TNG. And, uh, like, he changes his, it's, his, like, cadence. It's different. You know what? I think it flipped for him when, uh, I, I think maybe pinpointed the episode Heart of Stone, because the B story in that episode, I believe, is Nog wanting to enroll in Starfleet Academy, and Quark's all against it. Yeah. And Rom supports him in his decision. And suddenly he's his supportive father. Yeah. Uh, right around then is when suddenly he has engineering prowess. Yeah. He didn't have that before, as far as I understand. Um, but anyway, we should we should wrap this up. This is uh, much longer than I expected it to be for uh, for, <laughs> yeah. for just uh, how we felt about. It. You guys should go see this movie. We ended up just talking about DS Nine. You guys should see this movie. Um, how do you guys? I uh, what do you think is the prerequisite for walking into this movie? Because this felt like it was for people who know this show. Yeah, I well, feel like it. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. And I appreciate you, that I most assuredly. That, yeah. But this is not for a. This is not accessible for a wide right. audience. Right. Not a not a huge audience, but as someone who knows the least of DS Nine of anybody in this room right now, I felt that it was still accessible for even someone who'd seen as limited amount as I do because yeah. I do know these characters. These characters do mean something to me, especially you know in the, in the context of Star Trek. So it felt like. A, and <clears throat> this didn't. I actually did know how DS Nine wrapped up. This didn't spoil anything for me. Right. But we, well, we did the, Star Trek Love for so long. There's no way you wouldn't have every major thing spoiled for you. Uh, right. We, and, we did that for 15 years. Uh, yeah. The whole time. So the so having having said that, this was accessible even to me who knows a very limited amount of DS Nine, and I enjoyed getting to see the depth of these actors and their characters, and will actually inform later viewings of episodes I've never seen before. I would, uh, I mean, I would say, you, you, I mean, every, I mean, really, really major things are going to get spoiled if you don't know that show. Mm -hmm. um, That's so, true. Oh, yeah. You need to at least watch Dominion Moore and see the ending of that show. Right, right. I... Uh, is there is there anything, uh, Adam, that you feel like we really? I mean, either you guys, that you feel like we really should have talked about that didn't come up. I mean, I love the end credits thing. Did you with like, just all these things that that uh, Baron and Anna yeah, are throwing out that we didn't <laughs> yeah. get to? Because yeah, yeah. it's a really complex show. Right. They don't have time. Right. This could have yeah. been a documentary series. I love it when he's like, "This is a little spoiler, but I, I not a big deal. I don't think." I love it when uh, when when he goes, and obviously uh, that was all scripted. Right. But all the scripted stuff's really well written. I mean, it's funny. Right. But when when he's like, uh, but it would be like eight hours, and she's like, why is that a problem? Right. right. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. I've always felt like if, if it, that's it, what it calls it for, just it, do it. it well, it would be too expensive. It. No, of course. I can't live with it. But <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. Oh my god, that, that killed me. Anyway, um, but you look like you were about to ask me something. Oh, I was gonna say, did you like? I liked seeing the fan. You know, I enjoyed seeing the fan talk about how it impacted their mm. lives and stuff, too. I mean, these documentaries usually go to that place. Like that, yeah. um, what I liked about it here is that uh, it, this is a movie that squarely knows what its audience is. Mm -hmm. Its audience are the people who paid to make it. Mm -hmm. Like, people paid for this, right. and then they made a movie specifically for those people. Right. That's what you do with a thing like this. Right, right. And that was not a, I mean, you saw those names on the screen. That right. was not a small amount of people. No, it was not. 
And then for all, all of us that I uh, didn't, there. For, for, for all of us that didn't find out about this until way after the Indiegogo was done, right. yeah, that would have given to it I if totally we'd known about it. Given it, given it that. There's, there's, there's still more of an audience than just the people that paid for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, anything else you guys want to bring out real quick? Uh, you we, you we did end? mention the whole uh, after Michael Dorn came on, like for it, it, it changed the nature of things. Uh, they they talked about the fact that you know while they all loved Michael Dorn, they felt a little bit spurned by the fact you know that they that the network execs were bringing in someone from the next generation to try to bring in more of an audience, and they're like, well, we should just be able to do it on our own. So I thought that was an interesting dynamic, but nobody held it against him per se. I've seen other things where they talk about, oh, and then we got this guy from this, and like, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. But. It's 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 one of those things where you have to truncate these sections so much in order to make it, uh, you know, not a million hours long right. and still and still be able to talk about a lot of different things. So, mm -hmm. like, I would have liked that section to have somehow gone on longer because mm -hmm. they talk about how a, a lot of them uh, felt kind of shafted, and I liked it specifically. Nana Visitor was like, uh, well. Well, you know, I was I was threatened because I thought that he would be the right hand man, and right. I would get put it to the side. Yeah, 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 and anymore. and I mean, like they were really smart to create a a a, a, yeah, a role for him on the stage, right. Right? like a brand new, new role, position, basically. Yeah. Uh, and that's why it worked. Right. And uh, like nobody gets like that's really impressive. People get shafted over seven of nine, mm -hmm. yes. and. I think, uh, we, we, specifically with that example, Kate Mulgrew was kind of oh, right to feel to was. feel bad about it, yeah. and, 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 and I mean, like, I get why she felt that way. Yeah. It was it was handled so much better on DS Nine. We're like, they were so good at integrating new characters and giving everybody a lot to do anyway. They knew how to right. do that at Certainly. that point. That's because there was a lot to do on the show. It was like you said, it was so complex. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and so, like, like. It's a little clunky at the beginning where they're not sure what exactly to do with Worf. Right. But the answer isn't make every episode a Worf episode no. <laughs> like right. it was with well, Seven of Nine. Right. Yeah, and so that's why they ended up working. But I would have liked that section to have gone on a little bit long, longer where they're talking about uh, how they felt about him coming in but also how they liked him. But there's no resolution to that where nobody's nobody after that says what, I, what I'm yeah. talking about where they're like, but it ended up being integrated and and right. and, uh, and, and and worked really well. And we were ultimately yeah. glad to have him there. At no point does anybody say maybe they did an interview that didn't make it in. Um, well, well. Uh, after a while, Michael Dorn was 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 one of us. Right. And I was a little surprised nobody ever said that. Right. Right. I am looking forward to seeing whatever kind of special features they have when oh, it comes I know. out. Oh, yeah. me too. And I expect there to be a plethora of them. Yeah, they made allusions to some that I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. I definitely want to see that. I bet there are entire. Uh, Interviews. I mean, I mean, I bet there are like like people that weren't even in the documentary. Oh, there were, but they had they see. had like the pictures of people that said, "Thank you for being in this. Sorry, we had to cut you." Like, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It was just it was it was everything about this was so classy. Yeah. Uh, oh, and how and about it that? Real, sorry, go ahead. How, how about the uh, how about the scene that they projected up on the the the, uh, the battle scene? Like that looked so cool. Just getting to see that on such a huge screen. Yeah, I'm back and forth on it. Actually, really? yeah, it looks faker to me b being being projected that big, uh, it, because it's early it's early CG and like they, they it's it's fun they, for me. I didn't. Necessarily, I'm not sure how uh, much they even remastered it or it, like like obviously it's widescreen and it's HD, but like I don't know. We were talking about this in the hallway uh, I, after after the the movie. I'm not sure what exactly they even did to it, but it it's it, it was actually a little bit tough. For me to watch that big, it looked kind of big. <laughs> it was just more fun for me, I thought, because you know I'm I'm used to looking at it on a four by three screen, so right, just yeah. finally getting to see it up there, that's that's really what got yeah. me. But some of that seemed a little a, a little more dated than it does on the smaller screen. Oh yeah, yeah. and that's true. Yeah, definitely, I would agree. And that. they presented it like, look how amazing this looks, and I'm like, I'm not sure, but. If you didn't go, you're not going to get to see it on a giant right. screen anyway. Right. So yeah. Uh, well, we should probably wrap things up. Anything else we've got? We've got to mention before we get going. I I covered all my stuff. I think that's everything. Yeah. Right, cool, <laughs> well, folks. Thanks a lot for watching. Yeah. We sure appreciate it. And uh, if you saw this documentary, leave us your comments. Tell us what you thought of it. And uh, we will see you again down the road with more Star Trek content with these guys. And in the meantime, I was Captain Logan. That was Brandon Grimm. Hey. And that was <laughs> Adam. Hey. <laughs> no, he said, hey, so your next line is, of course, ho. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I was Captain Logan, and we will see you again in the not too distant future. Bye, folks.